righteous man availeth much. Okay. That allows the people in the nursery to hear. Now, God shares this historical event. This is not a story. This is a, an event in the life of a spiritual warrior, a winner. And the Lord shares this historical event from his life to show us the mindset and lifestyle of a mature believer who is intimate with God. Because Elijah had surrendered in his mind and heart, his life, his soul, to focus on nothing but the Lord. He was totally surrendered so that when, when he understood what the Lord wanted, what the Lord likes and desires. See, maturity brings you to a place where you're intimate with God. And you begin to understand what God wants, what God's doing. You see, we pray for all kinds of things. I would encourage you to look around your life and, and try to discern what God is doing. What's he working on? Who is he working on in your life and what's he working on with them? And, and get on God's team and participate in what God's doing. And ask God, agree with God, that what he's doing is the right thing. And add your voice, add your voice. This is a, listen, your voice for the Lord doing truth is powerful. Because it is a vote against the evil one. Which is what this, this is our role. Our role is to be witnesses against the evil one. You see, he could have had everything that we have. God offered it to him. He had to it because that's his character. He could have had everything that we have. But he said, no, I want to do it my way. I want to run things. I want to run my own show. And God said, Nobody runs their own show with me. That's something to think about there. I talked to a man yesterday, someone very dear to me, who's still convinced that he can run his own show. He can be angry about the disappointments in his life and be angry with God, shake his fist, and somehow it's going to turn out okay. Now listen. Listen. That's just, that's a simple one. You walk into a room, and who's the biggest one in the room? His name is Jesus. He's big. And you say, look, I'm mad at you, and I'm going to take you home. Okay, you're a smart guy, aren't you? Really smart. I didn't know this guy was that stupid. Anyway, what, what God is going to teach us through this is not only the, the lifestyle of a mature believer, Old Testament style, and also what to pray for. You say, I don't know what to pray for. If you Listen, if you're growing, and you're a discerning, growing believer, you often have to think, you have to ask, what do I need to pray for here? What is God doing? What, what is God after? What is God, want, what is the result he's looking for? And those are the things you pray for. If you look at Paul's prayers, he prayed for nothing spiritual. I mean, everything he prayed for was spiritual. John, he prays for our prosperity in every category so that we might give. But Paul prayed for his prayers were pure spiritual, that you may grow in grace, that you may know and understand, that you may be able, enabled to serve. That was the prayers. Now, uh, when Eli listen, when Elijah saw his nation, 22 years under Ahab, degenerate and, for, and false gods and religion, temples going up everywhere and statues going up everywhere and false worship going up everywhere, he decided that he wanted to help 
God do something about it. And so he he made a prayer, an effective prayer. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And boy, he availeth much. This prayer we're going to see. Now, now if you're in chapter 16 of 1 Kings, we're going to look at uh, 29 through 34 as a perversion. Ahab and his wacko wife. Uh, 17 1 is going to start the prophetic prayer. And then verse 2 through 16 is going to be the provision of God for, for Elijah during this difficult time. Because he's going to pray a difficult time on his own nation. He's not going to pray for prosperity. No. When your nation is corrupt, when your government is corrupt, you don't pray for prosperity. You pray that God will drop the hammer. And that, and that he will provide for you along the way. That's what you pray. You pray that he'll drop the hammer. Clean it out. You got a wound that's scabbed over, but infections in it. That's, like, that's our government today. It's corrupt. It's corrupt to the, to the core. You know, drain the swamp and all that business. So something has to happen in our nation to break free, to break into that scab and, and pull out the infection. And that's the corruption in our country, in our government. So let's look at 16, 29, start with 29. Let's read this and just talk about it a little bit. First of all, now Ahab, the son of Omri, became, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. Now you know that Israel is the northern kingdom and Judah is the southern kingdom. There's two kingdoms. And Ahab, the son of Omri, uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. In, in fact, he did more than all who were before him. That's saying something. I mean, this guy is the champion evildoer, is, a, is the king of Israel. And, and it came about as though it were had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, Jeroboam the son of Nebat. In other words, he's going to marry this foreign woman. That he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. This is the, connected to the sins of Jeroboam. But he married a foreign woman, which is, which is not supposed to happen. And no king of Israel was supposed to marry a foreign woman. So we got to call Solomon. You know, Solomon was the record breaker there. But I remember Bob Thiem said, wouldn't you know the record breaker would be Record breaker sinner would be a believer. Uh, so he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. He built a temple and built a statue for Baal. Baal. And Ahab also made the Asherah. Uh, let me read what I, I wrote all this down. Uh, the Asherah, what was the Asherah? We'll get to it in a minute. Uh, no, the Asherah was the female counterpart to Baal. The Asherah was the female uh, god in, in connection to Baal or Baal. Uh, so he made the Asherah, and he did more to provoke the Lord, the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Uh, in the day, in the days of uh, Hale, the Bethelite, in, in his days, in these days during the reign of Ahab, uh, Hael built Jericho. He rebuilt the city of Jericho, and it cost him two sons. It cost him two sons. Let me get you to read with me. Oh. Uh, Go to Joshua 6.26 real quick. I want to show you just a few of these things. 
Joshua 6.26. This is at the, after Jericho has been destroyed. Joshua made them take an oath at that time saying, Cursed be, cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds this city Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation. With the loss of his youngest, he shall set up its gates. That's exactly what happened to this guy. During the reign of Ahab, this guy... Uh, Hael rebuilt the city of Jericho and his oldest son died as they built the foundations and his youngest son died when they put up the gates. Amazing stuff that's going on in the nation of Israel during the reign of Ahab. Now Ahab was the seventh king of the northern kingdom. And listen, there never was, there was, shouldn't have been a northern kingdom. Shouldn't have been one. That was a split that was based in sin. Humanly speaking, he was a good king, especially with foreign policy. He reestablished trade with the Phoenicians, made peace with Judea, made an alliance with the king of Damascus. But spiritually, where it counts, uh, he was weak, an evil leader. He led the nation into idolatry. He did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all before him. He considered it nothing trivial to follow the sins of Jeroboam to marry a foreign woman and establish an idolatrous religion in the nation of Israel. His wife Jezebel, the princess of Sidon, worshiper and promoter of Baal, a, a woman who brought idolatry to the land. Uh, in 1 Kings 18.4 we read that he killed the prophets of Yahweh and in 1819, we read that 450 prophets of Baal ate at her table. In other words, she supported the work of 450 evil prophets. Baal was a sun god who controlled the skies and the giver of rain. His worship included human sacrifice of children and sexual immorality. The story goes... And I heard this from a reliable source that people would go to this temple, this Baal temple in worship, and they would take their children and they would begin to have sex with either a male or female prostitute. And as they were having sex, their children in the next room were being fed into a fire and burned up slowly. And their screams excited the, the worshiper to be able to reach some orgasmic experience. And that, that's the reality. That was history of Baal worship. So, if you read some sources in America that this type of stuff is going on today. This type of stuff is going on in this country at, at the highest levels. Just a rumor. Who knows? Often rumors are based on the truth. Now, Ahab was an evil king who, dis who disobeyed God and he married a foreign woman. Deut Deuteronomy 7.3 forbids that. He was an evil king who led the nation into religious perversion, idolatry. Jezebel was a murderer, murdered the prophets of Yahweh and Naboth for his vineyard. This royal couple brought corruption into the land under Baal. Baal. Now Elijah, go to 17.1. Elijah the prophet and the patriot, he gives us a prophetic prayer. And listen, all, all prayer that is given properly with right <laughs> motives, asking for the right thing, is prophetic. Because you just ask for it, and God says yes, it's certain to happen. You can actually impact the future of your life and those around you. You can impact their future. It's true. Now, 
question. How much are you, how much time are you investing in this? How much effort, how much focus do you spend? How much time do you spend thinking about your worldly issues and pursuits, your job, your house, your whatever, compared to your prayer life? I'm not trying to fuss at you. I'm just trying to show you where we're, where you're focused, what you're focused on. As you grow and mature, you become more and more focused on God. All of these things have to be done. You're, you have to go to your job. You have to take care of your house. You know, you have to go to the grocery store and spend a zillion dollars. Uh, but within all that is spiritual life. No matter where you go, what you do, God is with you. God is in you, talking to you, ministering to you, sharing with you his ideas, his plan, trying to give you the perspective of what's going on around you. And your voice added to his is what he's given as a weapon for us to change what's around us. But you have to wake up and you have to be aware of what's going on around you. See, Elijah looked at all this and he asked himself, what does God want out of this? What does God want me to do? What's the right thing to happen here? And he realized it wasn't to pray for prosperity. We always want prosperity. But sometimes, more often than not, Adversity is what we need to be challenged to grow. The adversities of your life force you to step up and rethink and rework your mindset, your belief system, to be able to look at life. And God, God gives you more and more complexity in your life, which in the world, it's more complex. In your relationship with him, it gets simpler. Just listen, it gets very simple. If you look around and see what God's doing in this cesspool of a, of, a, of a world that we live in, the devil's world, and you see what he's doing, and you simply get on his side and agree with him. You get on his side and agree with him. You just walk with him. You're there. Go, Lord, What it, send me to do. Send me. I'll do it. What do you want me to do? And what he wants you to do is, is become aware of what he's doing and what he's after and get involved with it. Yep. Somebody's texting me. I guess it's Jesus. Uh, should I look and see? <laughs> Elijah the prophet is the Lord God of Israel... This is verse 1, 17, 1. As the Lord God of Israel lives before, who, before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years, and it was three and a half, except by my word. As the Lord, of God, uh, Lord God of Israel lives, in compar listen, in comparison to Baal, who is, who is nothing more than a dead piece of wood, artfully crafted to represent a significant presence. You know, it's supposed to be this significant presence, but it was nothing. It was literally nothing. They're praying to a statue, a piece of wood or stone. Now, there's nothing sillier than that. Nothing sillier than that. So, as the word of the Lord came to him, say, see, where, where is he getting this? He's not making it up. The word of the Lord came to him because he, listen, he was open to it. He was listening for it. Question. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You know that, right? He's there forever. He's not leaving. He is, he is moment by moment ministering to you, teaching and guiding and comforting and encouraging. Moment by moment, he is ministering to your soul. And the way that he does that is through your own inner dialogue, through your own inner discussion, 
through the images that you see and produce in your soul under his ministry, under his leadership, you see and say within yourself the truth and the word of God and the will of God. Uh, what's, you, you, you're, you're having this inner discussion, not with yourself, but with him. Now, it's simple. The way human beings think is through inner dialogue. And we speak to ourselves, we talk to ourselves about what's going on, what we're doing. We just simply talk to ourselves all the time. That's called inner dialogue. We also create pictures, images that not only guide us and in, in show us what we're doing, but that's how we actually store our memories through images. When you think back on something, you'll pull up a picture, an image, and that's how memory works. But the spirit, here's my point, the spirit wants you to, to open your mind. Open your ears. Listen. If you don't know what you're saying to yourself, listen, then you're, you're asleep. You're asleep. You don't even know what you're saying to yourself. Because that's what guides you and causes you to do. It causes you to think, feel, say, and do what you're doing. That's your inner dialogue. It's the guidance system. And if you don't know what's going on in your own soul, you're asleep. So you got to wake up, you know, hello, time to wake up and listen to the Spirit. He is speaking to you constantly. Now, I know that can be sort of a nebulous thing, but listen. If you don't know the Spirit, and all you're going on is the principles of doctrine, no Spirit relationship, then you are in legalism. The Word of God has become just a set of rules to go by. There's no dynamics. You're just following rules. So, and I, I know some of you don't agree with me, that's fine. Uh, you 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 will one day, uh, but the Spirit speaks to us, leads and guides us from within, and He uses our own inner dialogue. So you got to wake up. You got to be aware. So this is how Elijah knew what to pray for, because the word of the Lord came to him. He said. The Lord said, go away from here and turn eastward. Now, he's already prayed and pronounced. See, 1 Kings depicts it as a pronouncement. There's not going to be any rain until I pray for it. James tells us it was a prayer. Okay? So it was, it was both. It was Elijah simply voicing articulating what the Lord had given him. Here's what needs to happen, Elijah. Ask for it. I'm going to give you the privilege of asking for it. And I'm going to give you the privilege of time to, for rain to come back for, to be able to ask for that. I mean, what a privilege. Holy smokes. Now, so... He asks, he knows there's not going to be rain, and the Lord tells him, get away from here, go eastward. He's, he's to go over the Jordan. Hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens, which is an unclean animal you couldn't eat. Uh, I've commanded the ravens to provide for you there. This is really interesting. I stopped and looked at the ravens for a little while. It was just interesting. You know, they're an unclean animal. Mostly what they eat is, is carrion. Carrion is uh, dead animals. You know, they're, they're like vultures. They eat. So Elijah had to be wondering. You know, at first I'm thinking, where is this meat coming from? You know, how long has it been dead? But, listen, go down to verse 6. 
And the ravens brought him bread and meat. So I, I can't imagine ravens rolling out some biscuits and baking them on the fire. I can't imagine that. So they're getting them somewhere. They got the bread from somewhere. They went in and stole it and took it to Elijah. So, <laughs> look, God, when you, when you live your life, Depending on God. That means that your finances come day to day. Day by day. And most of us, most of us have jobs that have allowed us to go beyond that. And we have savings programs and we don't live day to day. Some of us though still live day to day. Month to month, literally. We don't know if or where it's coming from. We just don't know. And... People in ministry live like that. I mean, when you're dependent on what other people give for your own living, then you really are dependent on the Lord. When you live that way, out on the edge, you, you learn to listen to God. You learn to listen because you're dependent. You're not dependent on a job. You know, Obamacare. You know, the government. You're you're living right there with the Lord, day after day after day, and He brings food to you. This is what Elijah learned. He's living in these birds, and what's so interesting is when you're there in your life. You know, if the if the economy goes bad, which I can't hardly imagine one that gets worse in the last eight years. But when the economy goes bad and the giving dries up, those people in ministry, they struggle. But listen, the Lord is faithful. He is faithful to provide one way or another. And it's often hilarious the way he does it. It's hilarious. And by the way, if you're interested in, in helping, if you get if you got a little bit of I've got two people that are desperately in need. One's right at homeless, and the other lost his job right before Christmas. If you want to, if you want to contribute to those people, let me know. But Elijah, uh, let's see, let's read it. And the ravens brought him bread and food, and it happened that after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, See, he's listening. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs in, it's in the nation of Sidon, and stay there. See, S S Zarephath is the hometown of Jezebel. you got to love it. I've commanded a widow there, the most helpless of all people, a widow. I've commanded a widow there to gather, uh, to, to take care of you, to provide for you. So he arose and went there, and when he came to the gate of the city, there was a widow gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives. See, she recognized him. I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and then we're going to die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it to me. Afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus the Lord God of Israel has said, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. There's a promise, huh? There's a promise. Do you, listen, do you really believe that if you lost your job, lost your income, if the, if the retirement system failed, like the, like the real estate market did, and your money cap stopped coming in, that 
God would provide for you? Do you believe that? Listen, if that were to happen in your life, you would believe it because you would see it. You would watch it happen as God provided for you all different kind of ways. So, this is what happened, is happening in his life. She went and did as, the word, as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Now, the Hebrew, he says, neither, neither rain or dew is coming. And he prays according to God's promise. And he prayed for no rain. James says he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. Prayed again and it rained. Wow. When Elijah recognized the degenerate influence of Ahab's idolatry, he decided to appeal to the Lord to turn his nation around and back to the Lord. Hey, you understand that? You interested in seeing our nation return to its, its basic principles of truth, honor, integrity, rightness. Now, the last discussion here, provision for the drought, we've already basically talked about. Uh, the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord is this... He keeps saying that, the writer keeps saying that, and the word of the Lord came to, to Elijah. Now, the question again is, are you listening? Because the word of the Lord is coming to you through the ministry of the Spirit and the word of God, are you listening? Not only listening from the, this wonderful, wonderful ministry that has been behind this pulpit. Wonderful ministry. Listen, what you get from the pulpit is great. But what you get from within is what makes it real in life. It's what makes it real. It makes the truth functional. Again, listen, if you don't have that, if you've not opened up to that part of the spiritual life, if you're afraid because you think it's charismatic or it's, it's hokey, I promise you it's not. It's not hokey. To listen to the Spirit. John 14, 15, 60 explains that he leads, he guides, he teaches, he reminds. All that stuff happens within you. Within your soul. So. Now turn over to James. Let's look at James, what James says about this. And then we'll just do a few principles. I appreciate you. Your patience with me. I'm in a great deal of pain up here. It's just something you have to deal with. Now, James 5, 17 and 18. Elijah, look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Now, what does that mean? We've been taught not to do that. It doesn't mean, James is not saying, stand up in front of the church and tell everybody where your sins are. Don't ever do that. But I believe what this means is that in your private, intimate life with another believer, you can help each other with your struggles. Rhonda and I do this all the time. We help each other. We pray for each other. We talk to each other. We know what's going on with each other, where I'm struggling. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. I have a couple of other people in my life with whom I have that kind of relationship and wide open, you know, these people are allowed to say anything to me that will be, they believe will be helpful. It's a wide open deal. It is vice versa. It's a great thing to find. And that's what I think he's saying here. Now, the effective prayer of a righteous man, I like the King James, availeth much, but it can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, 
In other words, he was not a superhero. He was not Superman. He was just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So, he's a man like us. He was no superhero. He was subject to weaknesses like all of us. It says he prayed earnestly. It's an interesting construction. Across UK, it's like it's in prayer. While he was praying, he prayed. It's, it's the same word, one on the other. And it's actually in a paraphrastic construction, which it brings intensity. It's intensity. And this is a prayer of intensity. And it's not like he grunted out some prayer, you know. It's, he was for real with God. This is the real deal, God. I'm really wanting you to do this. I really know this is the right thing. And he got real with God. And, didn't, and God answered his prayer. Now, what do you want for your loved ones? Pleasure and prosperity? Of course you do. Peace and intimacy with God? Of course you do. You want these things, these results in their life. You want them to be able to know the Lord and enjoy his his presence in your life, in their life. But if you pray for the wrong thing, then you're not going to get, you know, that's not, not going to be effective. Pray for the wrong thing. You know, if you pray for their pleasure, because you get, just can't stand to see them hurt, I understand that. One of the most difficult things in life is to see your own children hurt make stupid decisions, and hurt themselves. You pray that the Lord will hammer down on that person until they holler calf rope, until they give up their arrogance and their anger and their lust and their, and their rejection, their disobedience. You, you pray that God will do whatever it takes short of death and then maybe even that. Having learned how God uses adversity for our growth, James will tell you about that. Paul will tell you about that. Do you have the faith and courage to pray adversity on your loved ones that they might seek the Lord? Wouldn't it be nice to see your kids seek the Lord? Oh my God. Listen, I, I have radar. I have radar for positive volition. I have radar. I, I, I sense it. The Spirit show, gives me discernment about it. And listen, the moment that I sense spiritual hunger in my children, inside, I'm going to jump over the house. You understand? That's all I care about. I don't care if they have money. I, don't, I want them to know the Lord. That's what it's all about. Now, I'm, I'm willing to pray adversity on them that God will get in their life big time to bring about this realization that he's the only one that can make their life work. So, idolatry, what is idolatry? It's dependence on anything or anyone in the place of the Lord. For your happiness or provision. When you're looking to the government, when you're looking to your job, when you're looking to a person, you're, you're into idolatry. Elijah prayed maximum adverse. Listen, when you live in an agri agricultural society, drought is the worst. Nothing can grow. Therefore, listen, the animals can't find anything to eat. Everything dies. The grass dies. You, there's no, no, you can't grow anything to eat. So people die. Lots of people die. He prayed maximum adversity to break the idolatry of his nation. His goal was to break the idolatry. So he had a discussion with the Lord. Father, 
What will it take to break the idolatry, to break the corruption? What will it take? And he told him. And he said, well, that's what I'm asking for. Let's do it. Do we trust God to ask him to rain adversity on the United States and turn our people back to God? Do we have the guts to do that? To rain adversity down on this country so that we can turn back to God. All proper prayer is a prophetic pronouncement because you pray it and you ask and if it's the right prayer and for the right reason, God will do it. It's done. The mindset of the mature believer is, a, is absolute confidence that he honors his promises. This is how you pray. You pray according to his promises. Listen, as you get to know God, have an intimate relationship with God, you begin to understand what he's doing, what he's thinking, what he's after. From that perspective, you can pray and get on his team. I don't know any other way to say it. The, the farther I go with him, the more I grow, the more I understand that he wants me on his team. That he says, what I'm doing in your life and around you is good. It's good. Now, it may not always look good. It may be difficult on people. It may, may be adversity related. But I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm looking for good results because I'm a good person. And boy, is he. He says, get on my team. Stop looking at the material world. Stop, stop fighting with me over money and, and provision. Stop be. Be content with what I give you. And let this trust me for everything. And let these things I'm doing roll out and get involved. Pray for those things. Participate in those things. Get on my team. Y'all, does that make sense? Get on my team instead of your team. Get on my team. There's a young girl named Mara. Uh, that... I did some counseling with a sweet little girl. You know, crazy, but sweet. Uh, so for some reason, she just went in a coma. Just went in a coma, you know. She, she went to bed one night and went into a coma. 22, I think, years old. And uh, so you say, I mean, healthy little girl, sweet little girl, nice girl, good Christian girl, hungry to grow. And you go, Lord, I'm not sure I get it. And he's like, bear with me. Trust me. So I'm like, all right. You know, whatever this is for, if he takes, if he allows her to die, it's to impact somebody for their salvation or, or to accomplish some great goal. Do you believe God if that's in your life? That's your daughter. You believe and trust God then? Are you on his team then? This is when prayer begins to be effective. Is as you get into God's life and seeing things from his perspective and entering into this world and fighting for his purposes and his cause to win the hearts of all those around you for to worship him, to serve him. That's our that's our job. Is to win the hearts through the word of God, through listen, through love. Through love. There's nothing more powerful than that. I promise you. I used to think that was hokey stuff. I used to think a lot of stuff was hokey. Singing was hokey. And my how far we've gone. And Winning the hearts of those around us with love. Listen, you commit yourself to love these people, be kind to these people, and patient, and, and be loving, and giving, and giving, and giving, and giving. I promise you, they will see you as a as a source. Listen, John says you'll be you you'll have rivers of living water flowing out of your soul. And that's who you want to become. You become a place where those that are thirsty and hungry for God can drink. Let's, let's pray.
Let's do the offering again. We'll do an offering. Father, what a great privilege to be part of all this. I, I hope that, that what's been said this morning has, has enlightened and encouraged some, uh, someone. Uh, I pray, Father, for, for those that may disagree with some of the things said. And I pray that they would just bear with the message until it can all be confirmed or not. I pray, Father, for the money that we give today, that you would take that and multiply it and turn it into millions and make a huge impact with it. We ask that in Christ's name.